Hello everyone, and welcome to today's video where we're going to look at chapters 14, 15 and 16 of Frankenstein. Um, chapter 14 is quite interesting. It tells us a little bit about the De Lacy family. And we've started to see the creature's interaction with the family. He's still separated from them. And obviously this comes to a kind of a resolution in the, in the section we're going to see today. Chapter 14 is a lot about Safi's story. And we mentioned Safi last time. And... The idea that the creature has potentially seen her as a rival previously. Um, this idea that if someone from a Turkish family is an outsider to white Western Europe and to, to kind of, you know, the, the, the Lacy's and the creature um, can be welcomed by this family, then there's hope for the creature there as well. We see the the kind of the relationship between De Lacy and uh, you know, Safi's family as well. This idea that they have um, this idea that Safi's father has been kind of put in prison. Um, he's tried and sentenced to death. The De Lacy's and Felix try, which brings about the kind of downfall of De Lacy, and it shows a noble nature in the De Lacy family. In this story, really, it's worthwhile reading. We've not highlighted too much too much of it there but it's worthwhile reading and it, it kind of contrasts with victor's own family really this idea that victor's parents kind of if you like go around just picking oh, oh we've got money we'll have this child and this child and this child um which is both benevolent it is kind but also potentially um exploiting working class people the de Lacy's are slightly different this idea that they have fallen on hard times they've fallen on poverty as a result of trying to help others and trying to help safi and it's interesting as well that obviously um what happens is safi's father is released or rescued and then of course the de Lacy suffer as well um they remain confined for five months before the trial took place the result of which deprived them of their fortune and condemned them to a perpetual exile from their native countries so they decided that felix tries to escape and help out and it leads to the downfall of the family here um, and Safi's father responds, you know, was favourable to the marriage, this idea, um, you know, he did loathe the idea that his daughter should be united to Christian, but he feared the resentment of Felix. So this idea that he knew that Felix and the de Lacy's had some power and obviously as, as a noble family saving Safi's father, but because they have lost their wealth and rank, the merchant commanded his daughter to think no more of her lover, but to prepare to return to her native country. So basically... Safi's father refuses her the right to marry Felix and basically says they're going to return to Turkey. And Safi forms a plan to escape as well, which um, is quite fascinating, really. It shows this idea of kind of going against her father's wishes um, and, and leaving there as well. And she does leave and she goes to find Felix. Safi nursed her. She leaves with her in attendance with the most devoted affection. But the poor girl died and the Arabian was left alone, unacquainted with the language of the country and utterly ignorant of the customs of the world. And it's really interesting that we talked about this idea of Safi and the creature almost as kind of parallels, really. Um, this idea that Safi is in the exact same position as the creature. And whereas potentially in chapter 13, we saw the creature as jealous of Safi, by the time chapter 15 starts and this negative story and Safi's story has such an impact on the family, from the family point of view on the creature, it impressed me deeply. And we're not talking there about impressed as being like, oh yeah, that's a great story. That We're talking about in terms of the emotional impact it has on the creature. I learned to admire their virtues and to deprecate the vices of mankind. He really, you know, the, the father's behaviour really kind of, uh, uh, if you like, a... Um, a wicked father and the creature knows all that all too well he deprecates that idea and admires their virtues and where we saw he, perhaps he was kind of i was boasting about being able to learn english faster than safi which of course he should do uh, given the, the constituent parts of his, of his frame this now marks a change in the creature um and he continues um he finds some books of course he continues to read about mankind and this you can see there's lots of highlighting coming up the novels in Frankenstein's the novels, the, the books he reads, provoke all kinds of feelings in him. Uh, he reads in Sorrows of Werther. Um, we, we've done this in a lesson. We've done the, the impact of books, but it's basically this idea. It's a kind of a, if you like, a love story about Werther, a young man um, prone to kind of being a bit hysterical sometimes. Falls in love with somebody, gets involved in a kind of a love triangle, and ultimately says so he's going to commit suicide at the end um and this idea he thought words to himself and the creature tries to associate himself with Werther. 
is has lofty sentiments and feelings um according well my experience so he, he associates with that he empathizes with words as character um but he doesn't precisely understand it as well from the point of view that with somebody or infatuated with somebody yet as as Werther is his character can say no pretension but it's sunk deep i incline towards the opinions of the hero whose extinction i wept without precisely understanding so when Werther dies the creature you know if you like sides with Werther really and feels this idea the sense of being an outsider and being rejected by people he loves is what the creature takes away from the sorrows of Werther and the creature starts to think about these uh, these kind of characters in the books he reads and, and associates himself with them. My person was hideous and my stature gigantic. What did this mean? Who was I? What was I? Whence did I come? What was my destination? And these ideas, he can't solve these questions as well. And he reads part of Plutarch's Lives as well. Um, this is quite interesting. Plutarch's Lives is basically a selection of characters from ancient greek and roman uh, or leaders from ancient greek and roman times um a selection of 48 i think it is where you've got kind of characters who are good and characters who are morally bad as well but plutarch seems to admire and love the heroes of past ages and so the creature in reading plutarch's lives associates with the good leaders the morally good leaders um who are successful and tends to reject the negative leaders um he wants the great start of a virtue this idea that he is powerful and i think the creature realizes he's powerful and he's got the potential to be a, a force for good here as well i was of course led to admire peaceful lawgivers numa solon and lycurgus in preference to romulus and theseus so this idea he admires peaceable lawgivers um rulers who are kind-hearted uh, but also focus on peace um and he kind of gets this idea then that potentially he is a you know a, a superior being at the moment in a position of inferiority and he has the ability to be a, a force for good and paradise lost is perhaps the the, the most important text really it's like a different and far deeper emotions uh paradise lost is the telling of the story of lucifer falling from god's right hand to become satan and it, it tells the story of the creation as well and it's interesting because the creature refers to characters from paradise lost frequently and shelley makes that kind of link between the creature as either adam or satan it moved every feeling of wonder and awe that the picture of an omnipotent god warring with his creatures was capable of exciting and of course this is what the creature has seen an omnipotent god victor to him is omnipotent or he believes he's omnipotent um he's had the power to create the creature and he wars with his creatures as victor does like Adam, I was apparently united by no link to any other being in existence, but his state was far different from mine in every other respect. He had come forth from the hands of a god of a perfect creature, happy and prosperous, guarded by the special care of his creator. So the creature views himself as being like Adam in that he was created, but so different from Adam in the respect that he was perfect, happy and prosperous and protected by God. Even when Adam... Um, was tempted by the serpent and Eve to eat from the fruit of the tree of the knowledge. Even then, God doesn't destroy Adam or doesn't reject Adam. He, you know, he banishes Adam from the Garden of Eden, but he's not banished entirely. You know, he's still kind of protected and, and kind of um, cared for by God, despite committing the original sin. But the creature sees himself as Satan, the fitter emblem of my condition. For often like him, when I viewed the bliss of my protectors, the bitter gall of envy rose within me. You know, Satan's envy for God's powers um, and desire to commit evil. And the bliss of my protectors, and the, the creature starts to realise here that he's different to the Delacys, and he's envious of them as well, and it's that bitter gall. And then, of course, the creature reads the papers about his creations. And I sickened as I read, hateful day when I received life. A cursed creator, why did you form a monster so hideous that even you turned from me in disgust? God in pity made man beautiful and alluring after his own image. But my form is a filthy type of yours, more horrid even from the very resemblance. And, you know, look at the kind of the, the aggressive language there. You know, this is my this imagery of self-loathing the creature feels. Hateful day when I received life. A monster so hideous. Uh, a filthy type of yours. And the aggression towards Victor as well there. Satan had his companions, fellow devils, to admire and encourage him. But I am solitary and abhorred. He's hated by mankind as well. It's quite a nice little, little extract there on the creature. Um, 
and he still continues with the family but ultimately he's kind of starting now to get to a position this sense of desperation when he reads the these novels the sense of desperation to be part of something to have his fellow devils if you like as well and he wants to be part of the de Lacey family the more i saw of them the greater became my desire to claim their protection and kindness um and it, it's that that he's after really my heart yearns to be known and loved by these amiable creatures and there's a real really poignant nature to the scene because this is what the creature wants he wants companionship he yearns for companionship and protection and we see he encounters the the old man de Lacey. um and it's interesting that shelley refers to this as a moment of trial and kind of justice is a quite an important uh, an important point in frankenstein i mean essentially by a kind of a i suppose a modern audience but even you know going back to a georgian audience this idea of the moment of trial and justice is represented throughout we've seen justine's trial we see the trial of victor for clerval's murder later on as well and the creature is now on trial really here um and you could link this is this a trial for the crown of voyeurism you know is this his idea he is kind of he's been spying on this family for for months years potentially and you know is this now the moment where he's going to be punished uh, but it's interesting that the creature feels like he's on trial and that sense of tensions that you know this idea of decide my hopes or realize my fear and he speaks to the lacy creature which is you know entirely honest there as well um and he's met with the hearts of men when unprejudiced by any obvious self-interest are full of brotherly love and charity you know so this idea that old man de Lacey, and he i think represents this you know he doesn't have any self-interest full of brotherly love and charity but this idea it's that dramatic tension isn't it you know this idea if these friends are good and amiable do not despair you know building up the creature to perhaps suspects that something kind would happen when of course it, we know it doesn't um and potentially the creature's harmatia you know we, we've said it's is this idea that he wants to be part of humanity so desperately has he made the wrong judgment here you know we look at kind of the de Lacey family we look at felix who they appear noble but are they just like Victor Frankenstein? Is this, you know, desire to kind of claim Safi almost? Is it something that's consumed Felix and brought about the downfall of his own family here as well, and the suffering of it of his father here? You know, is the cre has the creature put his faith in the wrong people? Are they good and amiable people? They do appear to be, and Shelley, through the creature's narrative, presents them as as being good people, morally good people. But the creature's narrative is as unreliable as Victor's. You know, his his emotions are heightened towards this family. You know, the creature says they are kind. They're the most excellent creatures in the world. He's clearly biased because they're the only people he knows who, you know, and even then he doesn't really know them. I am blind and cannot judge of your countenance. And this is this blindness there is quite important as, as a theme, really, because, of course, he can help them. And interestingly, you know, she as Shelley has old man de Lacey referred to the creature as a human creature uh, it will afford me true pleasure to be in any way serviceable to a human creature and we believe that but it's so interesting because you know this idea of him being a human creature again offers hope you know this kind of misleading language not a human a human creature um and of course you know it's just it sounds like it's old man de Lacey being kind but even then it offers this sense of hope for the creature that isn't there and ultimately when he said the old man um we're on page 104 now is the time save and protect me you and your family are the friends whom i seek do not desert me in the hour of your trial the desperation the seizing that kind of aggressive verb and then at the moment great god exclaimed the old man who are you you know even the blind man is is using language we've seen victor frankenstein use great god um at the moment of creation when you know great gods you know describing the creature's horrific appearance and the old man who can't see great god who are you even the old man is worried of the power uh, of, the, of the power the creature has and of course they arrive back from the fair and felix darted for other you know it's interesting there that it's, it's kind of mankind you know and this idea that the love and fear in mankind can force them to be stronger even than the creature to his knees i clung almost like a child a really poignant image and description of the creature he dashed me from the ground and struck me violently it's an aggressive verb and the creature i could have torn him limb from limb as he could you know given his strength 
but the creature's strength fails him because he's consumed by a bitter sickness and overcome by pain and anguish and misery there as a result of his rejection. And it's met by anger in chapter 16. Cursed, cursed creator, why did I live? Why in that instant did I not extinguish the spark of existence which you had so wantonly bestowed? And the creature contemplates suicide there, but he kind of escapes and... and a bit like Victor, really. He he fits, you know. He kind of he he kind of goes into nature. He col he kind of collapses. He's consumed by anger and fear and uh, and emotions and and kind of suffers. And he goes to have something to eat. And he, he behaves rationally and realizes that he will he will reapproach the family. But of course, by which stage the family have done everything they can to escape. My protectors have departed and have broken the only link that held me to the world. So the creature, if you like. I mean, they weren't really his link and they weren't his protectors. You know, it's this kind of this harmarsha, this self-deception potentially continuing in the creature's character. When I reflected, they had spurned and deserted me. Anger returned, a rage of anger. And we start to see the creature turn savage. And when we talk about the creature's character, we talk about the fact he's learnt to be good. He's been nurtured by the Delacer family to learn no difference between good. But is there not an innate sense of evil within his character? And he burns the cottage to the ground. I lighted the dry branch of a tree and danced with fury around the devoted cottage with a loud scream and lit and the flame licked it with their forked and destroying tongues. And there's this, this kind of sense of the fire brings him glee and fury and anger. And he's consumed with anger. Um, he screamed, almost like this savage description, this imagery of savagery in his character, and licked it with their forked and destroying tongues, almost like a kind of a serpent, or like the devil, you know, um, often described as having a forked tongue there as well. You know, satanic imagery of the De Lacy's cottage, of the creature getting his revenge on mankind. And then, of course, the creature has nothing to live for. He, he kind of looks in the diary and returns then to Geneva to find Frankenstein. And as he walks, you know, he goes up to the mountains and nature decayed around me and the sun became heatless. This idea that, you know, when we went back to chapter 11, we saw mother nature restoring the creature. Even nature can't bring him any sympathy. You know, nature can't bring him any comfort. There's, you know potentially that romantic movement this idea that nature decaying is reflecting the creature's feelings of anger and aggression and of course he arrives you know as he's arriving sorry he travels you know he is brought some comfort from nature though in the sense that the loveliness of the sunshine and the balminess of the air cheered even me uh, in the same way it does to victor there's that kind of parallel there's that sense of them as doppelgangers here you know two parts of a whole and soft tears bedewed my cheeks and of course, there's the episode with the rustics, where of course creatures, the creature rescues the woman from the uh, the river, drags her to shore, and is shot for his for his troubles. Another example of mankind interacting with the creature to cause him pain, uh, writhing under the miserable pain of a wound which shattered the flesh and bone. So not only is it physical pain now, it's the emotional pain of another rejection by mankind. And interesting, continuing the satanic imagery we've seen of the, the forked tongues. The creature has now a hellish rage and gnashing of teeth. And we've seen Victor gnashing his teeth. We've seen that referenced in the Bible, of course. But a hellish rage. And I vowed eternal hatred and vengeance to all mankind. And it's interesting that we could take the creature on surface level as this is now the moment where he's gone fully savage. He's given way to the darkness within his soul. And um, we could take him on that surface value because, you know, within less than a page, he's murdered William. But it's interesting that he kind of, you know, he says this. Is this not a kind of a potentially a hyperbolic exclamation? Ah, oh, damn you. I'm going to kill all mankind. And he faints in the same way that Victor faints. Um, and it's a fascinating parallel between the two characters. And so do we actually ever fully believe this, this hatred? Um, that, that he kind of that he has on mankind is it is it hyperbole you know are we to fully believe this you know we've all said things that we regret and do, is, is the creature doing this here and of course he, he approaches Geneva and he sees young William Frankenstein and as I gazed on him an idea seized me that this little creature was unprejudiced and had lived too short a time to have imbibed the horror of deformity if therefore I could seize him and educate him as my companion and friend, I should be not so desolate in this peopled earth. And it's an interesting point that Shelley kind of makes here. This idea, first of all, again, you know, the creature perhaps is his armarsha of putting his faith in humanity and the wrong people. This naivety, really. 
the, that William had lived too short a time to have imbibed a horror of deformity, because you only have to look at what he calls him, a monster, an ugly wretch, and an ogre. You know, he clearly does have an awareness of deformity. And also the fact that the creature kind of wants to seize him. You know, um, it's never going to go well if you've got to seize somebody to force them to become your companion. Um, potentially it could have happened. You know, it's something that's kind of often seen in 19th century literature. You know, you've got kind of Magwitch and Pip at the start of Great Expectations. But, you know, they're, they're kind of their complex relationship over the course of that novel. But, you know, it, it, by a modern audience, we'd be quite shocked and, and horrified by this. But obviously... You know, it would still be shocking to an audience, um, you know, to a, to a Georgian audience, to a Victorian audience, but potentially there's the uh, the element of, of support there that, you know, the creature does see this kind of stranger, this lonely child, and think maybe he is as vulnerable and unprejudiced and I kind of have a companion here. But it's interesting the language Shelley uses, this idea that he wants to seize him. And of course, you know, sadly, William isn't unprejudiced. And is he not unprejudiced because he is a Frankenstein? And, you know, is this idea that their family has this sense of prejudice uh, throughout them, you know, because he calls him a monster, an ugly wretch, exactly the same language that his brother is using. You know, Victor uses this to refer to the creature. So is this that mankind are all prejudiced against the creature as they have been to this point, sadly, or is it just a kind of a trait of the Frankensteins? And of course he realises you're Frankenstein. Frankenstein, you belong to my enemy, to him towards whom I've sworn eternal revenge. You shall be my first victim. And the creature murders William. Grasp his throat to silence him. And even the murder is ambiguous. You know, is it the fact that he's trying to just shut William up from screaming for help? Um, loaded me with epithets which carried despair to my heart. Is it this idea he's trying to stop him from speaking? You know, he doesn't... The, the manner of murder that Shelley uses, grasp his throat to silence him, could well be the actions of a man who doesn't know his own strength, um, trying to silence a child. Or it could just be, you know, I, I killed him. Whatever you you think about that, and it's interesting, you know, is this kind of a, a, a trying to get someone to be quiet gone wrong or an act of cold-blooded murder? I gazed on my victim, my heart swelled with exultation and hellish triumph. The creature say, takes triumph from this. Clapping my hands, I exclaimed, I too can create desolation. My enemy is not invulnerable. This death will carry despair to him, and a thousand other miseries shall torment and destroy him. So whatever the creature meant, he takes joy from the murder. You know, a tri hellish triumph. Clapping hands. You know, almost that childish glee the creature gets. And of course... He sees Victor's mother in the locket. I gazed with delight on her dark eyes, fringed by deep lashes and lovely lips. But my rage returned because, of course, he could never have something like this. And even if you know, he could, they would look at him in disgust and affright. And he was overcome by this feeling and the rage because, of course, he has no... ...of an agreeable aspect, blooming in the loveliness of youth and health, and then frames her... Um, the sleeper stirred, and a thrill of terror ran through me. Should she indeed awake and see me, and curse me, and denounce the murderer? It stirred the fiend within me. Now, this is quite interesting, because the creature, what he, you know, if he's just lost control of his aggression here, we can perhaps forgive that as an accident. And I know his response is obviously saying this is nothing at all accidental. What he does here is the creature deliberately does something wrong. A child who is trying to cause arouse suspicion. He's seen that he can be wounded. The creature he's been shot in the leg, so he would feel potentially, you know, he'd potentially fear for his life here. But now what he does is he deliberately knows that it is wrong to frame someone for death, and he frames Justine. And it stirred the fiend within me. And this in a, in a simple quotation: this idea that he's always had a fiend, a devil, evil within him. It's part of his nature. Not I, but she shall suffer the murder I have committed because I am forever robbed of all that she could give me. She shall atone. And he deliberately punishes Justine because they could never be together. The crime had its source in her, be hers the punishment. I had learned now to work mischief, and this idea, he's learnt to deliberately break the laws of man. And when we look back earlier on um, at how, for instance, so I'm just kind of going right the way through, when he'd seen how, on page 93, 
uh, from reading Ruins of Empires, how mankind's vice and bloodshed cause disgust and loathing. He's now realised that the laws of man, the laws of man can be used for him to cause bloodshed and vice and he is he's become evil he's given way to the savage nature in his character and he demands at the end of chapter 16 that victor create one as deformed and horrible as myself would not deny herself to me and that in itself is quite an interesting point because there's no way of knowing this and we'll consider this in a bit more detail when when we have we see victor's line of thought or shelley presents victor's line of thought in regards to create the female creature but if all mankind has rejected the creature, why wouldn't someone as horrible as the creature reject him as well? And it's a fascinating point. But chapter 16 ends with this being you must create the creature's final demand to Victor. And then finally they discuss this narrative, which we'll see in chapter 17.